uh, was uh, lucky enough to see some of the early drafts and then continuing drafts for Martin Fowler's book on the subject of domain-specific languages, and I use a few of his examples, and he in turn used a few of my examples in his book. But the, at the end of the day, the really interesting part about domain-specific languages, the techniques are interesting, but the really practical applications are the ones that I wanted to uh, talk about here, because we've been doing this long enough so we can start thinking about, well, from a practical standpoint, what are we doing with these things? And so my agenda for today is to actually show you four different practical uses for domain-specific languages and also show you along the way some construction techniques and how these things fit together. And these are the four practical uses, externalized configuration, building fluent interfaces, building smarter tools, and the ability to include algorithmic business rules and creating kinds of user interfaces that are both extraordinarily difficult to create and ones that your users don't like very much uh, there's a much better alternative that you can uh, provide a better tool in their hand and some remarkable innovation that's happened in this space over the last few years. Before I get into that, I want to motivate this problem just a little bit. And this is actually the uh, first example in Martin Fowler's DSL book. Let's say that you work for a company that sells and installs secret compartments. So think James Bond-like secret compartments. If you want to hide you know, a laser weapon in your house or something, you may install a secret compartment where you uh, close the door and then turn on the light and then open the bedside table, and that triggers the secret compartment to open. So you're in a company that supplies secret compartments to users, but you got a really good deal on Java-powered toasters at some point, and so you want to use that as the hardware that you actually install in people's houses. Um, and so what you really want, it's really expensive to reflash the toasters. Uh, so what you want to do is to be able to code the general behavior onto the toasters one time and flash them onto the toaster one time, and then be able to supply some code that configures the details for a very specific kind of secret compartment. Now before you accuse me of building something that is uh, no relation to the real world, this is the entire world in Java right now. Because every framework on Earth does this. They have general behavior, and then you use configuration to modify what that general behavior does. Every single framework that has an XML configuration file falls into this category. We see this pattern showing up over and over again out in the world. So let's say that we have a specific client, Mrs. H, and here is the formula for her secret compartment. You close the bedroom door, you open the second drawer in her chest, and turn the bedside light on. These have to be in sequence, and if you miss any steps, you have to restart the sequence over from the beginning. We know exactly what this is from a computer science standpoint. This is really nothing more than a state machine. You have a particular state, it has transitions to new states, and so we can easily model this in code as a state machine. And so you can imagine some code looking kind of like this. This is all code for the API that we're going to burn under the toaster. So events are either commands or things that happen in the room, either things that we do or events that occur that we may want to respond to. We may give them some sort of code or something like that. Uh, states are going to be modeled as a state machine. So these events, commands and events are states. And the state machine holds on to multiple states. And of course, they have transitions from one to another. And so you can imagine that state, there's a class state in here that has maps of things like transitions from one state to another, and the possible next transitions from uh, states, whatever the legal transitions are between states. And the state machine, you can imagine, has a way to construct it and then various ways to manipulate states, find out what next upcoming states, possible states are, etc. I'm kind of blasting through all this code because I don't really care much about this code. This code is going to be bla uh, um, burned onto the toaster one time as a one-time thing. What I really care about for the purpose of this talk is the configuration code for my toaster. And I want to talk about several different varieties of configuration code and pros and cons. So here's the first way we can configure it. We can just call the API directly in Java. So we call door close, create new events for these things, create new commands, create a bunch of states, and then wire up the uh, API. Uh, we need to add transitions and commands to the idle state and transitions to the active state, etc. But this code is really problematic in several different ways. 
One, it's terrible for our stated purpose because it's in Java. We have to recompile this and re-flash this onto the toasters, so that's not good. It's additionally not good because you have to read this code and think about it for a little while before you really realize that it's a state machine. It's not at all obvious just looking at the code what's really going on here. There's an awful lot of repetition here. The word idle shows up three times, active state shows up twice, unlocked panel state shows up three times. All that repetition makes it harder to read because it just kind of, it's numbing. So here's, let's think about an alternate way to do that. What's an alternate way to store that same configuration? Well, in this day and age, you would almost certainly do it in everyone's favorite markup language, XML. This is exactly how you would store this. You'd put an XML parser on the code that you flash onto the toaster, and now you can drop your XML file on there, and it can configure your framework to do the work that it needs to do. And for this usage, XML, for as much grief as it gets in the world, is actually quite nice, because XML has the built-in concepts like container shift that come in really handy here, that allow us to get rid of some of the reputation that showed up there in the Java code. Everybody uses XML for this because it's so easy to parse. Uh, we have XML libraries that make it super easy to parse, so we don't have to write parsers or lectures. Um, Martin Fowler refers to XML as a carrier syntax for domain-specific languages because you don't have to parse it. All you have to do is deal with the semantics of it once it's been parsed. And so that's one of the reasons we see this so prevalently today is that it's a really easy way to capture this externalized configuration. And that's exactly what this is, it's externalized configuration. And it has some nice characteristics. The original purpose for doing this for my toaster example is that we want late binding. We want to be able to configure our framework after we've compiled it without having to recompile it. And it's nice if you have a text file like XML because you change the XML, it reinterprets that as it reads it, and you get changed behavior. Of course, we don't want to recompile the toaster, the toaster code to change the configuration, so it's nice that it's in a text format. In this case, the XML is more expressive because it has some nice features that we like and, in fact, doesn't have features we don't need. It doesn't have an if statement or a while loop and other sorts of programmatic concepts that we don't actually need here in this data storage format, so it's very nice for that. It is declarative. Uh, meaning that it's not imperative, doesn't have any extra uh, things that we don't need to declare some facts about things. And of course, it is ubiquitous. Every framework that you see uses XML exactly for this purpose. And this is, in fact, kind of sneakily the very first practical use for domain-specific languages, one that you're already doing for every project that you're on right now, is using that as an external configuration. Those configuration files are nothing more than an external DSL, and all of them are unique because they all have their own grammar. That XML schema that goes with it defines the uniqueness of a particular file. The semantics are different, but the syntax is the same. And we use the syntax because it's very, very convenient. But what about this representation? This one's way better. It has a lot less noise than either the Java or the XML version. We don't have any uh, pointy braces that you can cut yourself on or anything like this here like the XML version did. This is uh, part of Martin's example in his book, and this is actually a custom grammar written, written with a tool in the Java ecosystem called Antler. Uh, if you think that the ability to write your own language kind of left off with Lex and Yak at university. You have a pleasant surprise in store for you. There's some fantastic open source tools. Antler is one of them. Major languages like Groovy use Antler as a grammar parser. There's even a free IDE called Antler Works that allows you to put your grammar together and test it and detect uh, syntactic cycles and other sorts of things that are hard to chase down by hand. Um, and in fact, when Martin created this example, he said that if you counted the entire time that it took him to download an XML library and get the XML parser to work and get the XML version to work, it took him about the same amount of time to create a custom grammar here and create an Antler grammar that would parse this stuff as well. The advantage here is that this is much more readable because I can put exactly what characters I want in there. I'm not restricted by some external syntax like XML. Of course, the downside is I have to write this language myself, and that's not nearly as horrible as it sounds, but it's probably a little more horrible than most people want to go to.
Uh, it turns out that there are some stunningly powerful tools that are starting to show up in this space that I'll talk about at the very end of my talk. So we've now seen enough where we can define terms. A domain-specific language is a computer programming language of limited expressiveness focused on a particular domain. This is Martin's definition, and as most of Martin's definitions, a very, very good one. Uh, he is very careful to call this out as a computer programming language. Because if you don't, this concept becomes much too broad and it uh, becomes very difficult to uh, wrangled in because it's so uh, sweeping and broad. I'll give you a perfect example of this. I have a bunch of colleagues of mine that really like cricket. I don't know anything about cricket. And when I walk up on them and they're having a conversation about cricket, they're using English words, but I have no idea what they're talking about because I don't have the context for cricket. If you think about it, pretty much all human species contextualize. There's a famous case in the U.S., you know, Starbucks has their own language, the way you order things at Starbucks. There's a restaurant chain in the U.S. called Waffle House. And the hash browns at Waffle House are really, really good. And there are like six different ways you can get hash browns. And they have a very terse one-word language for each feature. So you can say scattered, smothered, and covered and get hash browns with the minimum possible delay in the ordering process. It's really important to understand their domain language. So this is a really broad concept. It's useful to tie it down to computer programming language so we can talk about very specific techniques there. Of limited expressiveness, in fact, you don't want this to be a general purpose language. In fact, one of the measures of general purposeness is Turing complete. Uh, Turing complete is a, um, a mathematical definition of computational ability. And it turns out that you can accidentally make language is Turing complete. It's actually quite easy to do so, but they are much more complex when they are, and so you generally want to try to avoid that if you can. And of course, it is domain specific, so it's focused very tightly on a specific domain. Here's another alternative to Mrs. H's configuration. This is pretty close to the custom grammar version we saw before. It has a few more noise characters. It has double quotes. It has colons. It has these funny little arrows and those kind of guys. But the nice thing about this alternative is this is perfectly syntactically legal Ruby code. Ruby has very, very flexible syntax, and it's used a lot for building these style of domain-specific languages. And so in this case, all I need to do is take the JRuby jar file and, and burn it onto my toaster, and now I can drop this Ruby file onto the toaster, and it'll interpret it as Ruby code and configure my API. These could, in fact, be method calls to Java methods in my API, but Ruby lets you, JRuby lets you seamlessly call those. This is used very often to build internal DSLs because it's um, very, very syntactically flexible. Groovy is also used a lot for this exact same purpose, and I'll show you an example of a Groovy DSL in just a minute. And we've now seen enough to talk about the two different types of DSLs. The one we just saw is an example of an internal or embedded DSL. Embedded is kind of overloaded, and it kind of gets into the embedded uh, system space, which we're kind of trying to avoid here. So an internal DSL is a DSL expressed within the syntax of a general purpose language. So the Ruby version I just showed you is an example of an internal DSL. You don't have to write the parser, but you do have to adhere to the language rules for the underlying language. That's the only real restriction, which is why Ruby is a very popular language for this, because it has very, very forgiving syntax. You can leave off parentheses or put them on. There are all sorts of syntactic shortcuts you can take with Ruby, and it makes it really nice, because you can get rid of noisy stuff and just focus on the essence of the language that you're trying to create. They're really just a stylized use of language for domain-specific purpose. So you may actually violate some of the conventions in the language to make it work more as uh, and read better as a domain-specific language. I'll show you an example of that in just a moment as well. These are quite common in the developer world. And I'll show you some snippets from EasyB, which is one of these in just a bit. The other kind of domain-specific language is an external DSL, 
And this is one that is a separate language to the main programming language. So SQL is a great example of an external DSL. That's one that is you don't run inside the JVM. It has a separate syntax. There's a separate interpreter over there in a the database server. Uh, that's a good example of an external DSL. XML is also an external DSL uh, because it is not within the syntax of your native programming language. So remember, this is the code that I showed you before that is the direct API call for my uh, toaster. Is this a DSL? It's really not. It's really just an API. It's just me calling constructors on things and putting things together. But what about this one? This is still in Java. What I've done is kind of bent the conventions in the language a little bit to make it a lot more readable. So as I define my state machine now, notice in Java there's a convention that says well, when you're setting properties on something, it's object.set something and then return void. Well, I'm going to defy that because it makes it really noisy, so I'm going to create a define that allows me to set some properties on things. In fact, this code is looking even better. This is where I wire up my transitions and uh, those kinds of abilities. And notice what's happening here, like the second line down. This is actually just one line of illegal Java code. It starts with a, an object, ends with a semicolon. But we're using a technique here in DSLs called method chaining. So every one of these mutating methods, rather than uselessly returning void, making you stack them up vertically, I've made them all return this which means I can stack them up horizontally now and create what's called a fluent interface. I'm now creating a sentence of mutation rather than this long column and with all the repetition in it. This reads a lot better, almost like a sentence. And in fact, I've named my methods to facilitate and make it look more sentence-like. In fact, this is one of the criteria that you frequently find in DSLs is that you're trying to shoot for a language nature. You're trying to mimic some sort of uh, real language without going too far in terms of adverbs and adjectives and stuff like that. And so this is actually an example of a, a, a DSL technique called a fluent interface, which defines a capable behavior capable of relaying or maintaining instruction context for a series of method calls. That's exactly what's going on here. Every one of these methods returns this, so now the next method in the chain is being called on the same object. That's that maintaining instruction context for a series of method calls. And this is, in fact, my number two practical use for DSLs, taking APIs and converting them into something much more readable by using fluent interfaces. And I'll give you an example of when this came up in one of our projects. I was working on a project that handled the leasing of railroad cars. And railroad cars in the U.S. have a lot of really, really elaborate rules when you lease them. So, for example, if you uh, normally haul milk in a tanker car, if you ever haul tar in it even one time, you can never, ever haul milk in it again, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a good policy. I like that business rule. But the problem is you get these long, long lists of restrictions as you're trying to test and figure out what's going on with rail cars. And so we would have these two-page test setups, and we'd try to get our business analysts to read the Java code, and they didn't want to read Java. It's like, no, no, just tell me what it's doing. There's always a translation problem there. And so we converted that API into one of these fluid interfaces tried to make it read almost like English as we're setting these values. And that was enough to let the business analyst read it directly and say, yeah, that's what I want to test. Or no, we need to change this. It doesn't have a ladder on the side. It has a ladder on the top. It removed just enough Java-esque noise from it so they could read it almost like a data file format. They weren't modifying it, but we didn't even want them to modify it. We wanted them to be able to read it easily and tell exactly what it does so we can get the developer out of this translation phase that they've been stuck in. So before I show you some examples of building these things, so some more examples, there's a really important concept that Martin touches on very early on, and it is very, very important in this space to understand this. Notice now that we have Mrs. H's secret compartments. I've now shown you what four different representations of how to handle that configuration, Java, Antler, XML, Ruby. Um, you can sort of think of a DSL like a view over an API. 
So I've basically given you four views over that same Mrs. H uh, or that same uh, secret compartment uh, uh, API. And one of the things that you want to do is not put a lot of logic in the DSL itself. Just like it's very tempting to put logic in the web page when you're building a view in a web application because it's really convenient to put it there, it's not a good idea because it doesn't scale well. The exact same thing happens here. You want all the logic in your DSL to work in what Martin calls a semantic model. This is the API that you wrote that the DSL is really configuring or really manipulating in some way. And that's where you want all the work to take place is in that semantic model. Some of the tools in this space like Antler make it trivially easy to start dropping behavior right in your grammar file and that's a bad idea because before long that gets really convoluted and you can no longer separate the grammar stuff from the what it does stuff and now you've got a kind of a coupled mess. You want to make sure that you have good clean separation between the DSL which is manipulating things and the things being manipulated which is more just like a standard API. All these language techniques that you use to, to stitch DSLs together, particularly internal DSLs, rely on one basic concept. And that's this idea of context. Remember when I defined fluent interfaces, I said a behavior capable of maintaining a context across a series of method calls? It turns out that a lot of techniques in the DSL world rely on this idea of context. And so we actually just saw an example of a, a wrapping context with a method chaining. And that's a pretty common technique. There are a couple of pitfalls that you have to watch out for, like the finishing problem. Uh, there's another technique here, which is wrapping via parameters, where you send in these values as parameters and then uh, parse them that way. And another way of doing this is what uh, Martin calls functional sequence, uh, calling them as a series of uh, one-line method calls, but wrapping the context around them using some uh, Java syntax tricks. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about writing uh, internal DSLs in Java because nobody does it much, because it's really hard and they're always ugly. Java was never meant to be syntactically flexible. In fact, the polar opposite. It was meant to be very, very syntactically pedantic. So you have to put all the parentheses in. You have to put all the semicolons. You can't call methods on numbers, which is really a handy thing to do in DSLs. You have to do, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't have native dates and times and stuff like that. So uh, most of the work in Java is relegated to external DSLs. And that's one of the reasons that XML is so popular in the Java space, because that becomes a good target for holding this kind of information. More modern languages are much more likely to support this. And I'll show you a few examples here of building a DSL in Groovy and some of the support that Groovy specifically has for building DSLs. Groovy has dynamic typing, which comes in handy when you're being D building DSLs, but it's not a hard requirement. Uh, it turns out that Scala, which is more strongly typed than Java, is a fantastic host for DSLs. One of the reasons uh, the Scala designers did that on purpose, they wanted you to be able to create really nice internal DSLs in Scala, and so a lot of the, what I call collapsible syntax in Scala, the optional syntax that you can make melt away, makes it a really nice host for internal DSLs. Uh, Ruby, as I mentioned, is a really popular host for uh, internal DSLs, and so is Groovy. Uh, and dynamic typing is handy, but not strictly necessary. Scala gets away with this by using really good type inferencing and some other tricks like implicit defs and, and implicit casts uh, to get you away from having to put a lot of type information in your DSL. We also have closures as context holders. Those are a really nice way to carry context around and pass context around as parameters. That happens a lot in DSLs, and I'll show you a good example of that. That comes from EasyB in just a second. One of the really common things that you end up doing in domain-specific languages that is a weird thing to do outside this space is need to reopen classes. Not inherit from classes, but actually reopen the class definition and make changes to some of the stuff that's there. This is so common, in fact, that Groovy has two distinct open class techniques, one called categories and one called the expando meta class, and I'll show you short examples of both of these, because this really makes it easier to add fluency and naturalness to your DSL. Uh, 
So let's say that I was building an appointment calendar class. And I want to be able to write code that looks like this. Calendar add a new appointment for the dentist from 4 p.m. And calendar add a new appointment conference call from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. at some particular phone number. So obviously I can't get this to work in Java because I can't call methods or properties on integers. Um, this will work in Groovy because even constants in Groovy are called on the wrapper classes for integer. And this is how a category works. A category, this, is, this concept is actually borrowed from Objective-C. So a category is really just a, a class with a bunch of static methods in it. And the first parameter of that static method is the type that you're augmenting. So in the code that I just showed you, I said something like dentist appointment from 4.pm to 5.pm. The way that works is, if you'll notice, let me actually back up one slide here. If you'll notice here, I have this use block, use integer with time support, and that is in fact the name of my category class. So we, while you're within that use block in this category class, when you say 4.pm, it's actually going to map to get PM right here. Now, the reason this is called get PM and not just PM is that Groovy has a rule that says if you have a method that takes no parameters, and this one is not because that integer is going to be the type that you're augmenting, if you have a method that takes no parameters, when you call it, you have to put an empty open and close paren after it. And that's kind of ugly in my DSL, but if it's a property, you don't have to put the open and close paren. So I'm actually creating it as a property, as a get property, even though I'm mutating the value. This is a good example of the way that you kind of bend the language rules. But what this allows me to say is 1.pm. That's actually turning around and calling the get PM method, and it's augmenting my integer by returning its value in military time. So all three of these are new methods that I can call on integer while I'm within that use block inside Groovy. So there's my AM PM code, and you can see that I can, within that use block, AM and PM look exactly like any other method that exists on the integer class. So that's a category class. The nice thing about uh, category classes, and these are just uh, tests that show how this works. The nice thing about category classes is that it limits the scope of that change. One of the big troubles that they ran into in the early days in, in the Ruby world was a lot of these changes tend to be kind of global in the Ruby world, unless you do something really specific to lock them down. And so there were cases where people metaprogrammed the same things. And so for a long time, Flexmock and Mocha couldn't work together because they each modified in the runtime in incompatible ways. So being able to lock down the scope of this change is really nice and have it scoped just to this lexical block. But then Graham Roche was working on the Grails web framework, and he needed to do a lot of this kind of enhancement to existing classes, and this lexical restriction was too cumbersome for him. And so he invented a secondary mechanism for open classes in Groovy called the Expando Meta Class. So here's the same code using Expando. The difference here is there's no use block wrapping this stuff. The way Expando Meta Class works is there's basically an, a lazily initialized Meta Class property on every class in Groovy. So I can say integer dot meta class dot create a property name like get am or get pm that takes no parameters and in within the meta class there's a keyword delegate that is the object value of this class that I'm doing this I'm making a change to integer here that's a pretty sweeping change I might want to restrict that change to a very small block of code but if you look at something like Grails they needed to augment things like string and object and that needed to be really global and so one of the things that Grails does when it bootstraps is it runs a whole bunch of these expando meta class enhancements to get all those extra facilities in place before it starts bootstrapping the server and bootstrapping your web application. Let me show you an example of where this is used in the real world. EasyB is a behavior-driven testing framework that's written in Groovy. It's designed to do tests for either Groovy or uh, Java uh, projects, and it mimics several Ruby behavior-driven development DSLs. And this is actually my third practical use, is building better tools.
So here's an example. This is what a scenario looks like in Easy B. And we now know enough about Groovy to figure out exactly how this has been implemented. Because all this is is a method declaration that takes a string as the first parameter and a closure block as the second parameter. And that closure block starts there and ends there. So everything else in here, all these whens and everything is within that closure block. And if you look at something like when, it takes in a description and then a closure block, which defaults to empty so that you can have an empty when block and nothing blows up. So you can see that we're actually able to get a pretty nice English-like headers on all these guys just by writing methods called when and 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 then and chaining them together almost like a language stuff. There's another syntax supported by um, EasyB, and that's RSpec style. And I want to focus on one of these tests in particular. So this is playing with a queue. And so we initialize a queue, and it should put things in, it should uh, dequeue things we just enqueued. This is the one I'm really interested in, though. It says it should dequeue values in the order in which they were enqueued. So what I'm doing is sticking a few things in the queue, and then pulling them back out and verifying them. But I'm not showing you the source code for the queue class, but I would be willing to bet that you would be surprised if I showed you that class and then it had a should be method on it. In fact, my Q class does not have a should be method on it. But I'm using and calling that method to verify that this value is correct. So how am I doing that? So let's go look at the code inside EasyB that does that. So there's my code that calls should. When you look at the definition for it, it looks like this. It takes in a specification, which is the string, and then a closure block. And so all this stuff is inside that closure block. And if you go down about halfway through the code, you'll see use behavior category and call that closure block inside that behavior category. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Well, let's go see what the behavior category is doing. So there's my example story. There's where I'm calling that closure. My behavior category is a category class. And notice the type of the first thing here is object. This now adds should be on every object in my system. And I'm all done. Notice how nice that is. This one line of code here, and now every single object in the entire Java universe has a should be method on it where I can verify its value. This is the power of open classes. The ability to go in and make a change to object, and that automatically flows down to everything that's based on object, which is everything in the universe. This allows me to selectively add specialized methods like verification code and because I'm using this category block, I limit that change to only while I'm running this closure that is this verification code. So none of that augmentation to object happens except while I'm running my test. So there's very little chance I'm going to pollute anything in my uh, world. This is a great example of actually using open classes and uh, understanding the difference between a category and an expando and when to use one versus the other. While I'm on the subject of tooling, I was talking about XML earlier. There's actually an alternative way to generate this stuff if you want to. All of the major uh, dynamic languages uh, and some non-dynamic languages have these builders in them. Uh, and they use a, a particular DSL technique. So let me shift this over to a, a Groovy builder for a second. This will actually build the exact same uh, XML that I just showed you, but this is Groovy code. So let me go back for a second to the XML version. So you notice that this is a state machine that has a property called start equals idle, that has a bunch of event name, door closed, etc. When you look at the Groovy builder version of this, notice that I have the same overall structure. What I'm doing is using code blocks to delineate containership in my XML document. But you know, this is kind of magical. The Groovy guys were really, really prescient to, to realize this because they created this XML builder thing that already understood the state machine method and the, uh, the event method and the command method and the state method and allows you to do all that stuff. Of course, none of that stuff is in XML builder. XML builder is in fact an empty class uh, and takes advantage of a language feature called method missing. 
So when you call one of these methods, instead of calling an exception, it falls into method missing. And all method missing does is say, we'll take the method name and whatever it contains and generate corresponding XML for that. So now any kind of code you want to put in there just gets dynamically generated as XML. All the builders, or most of the builders work like that. And that's a good third uh, 3B uh, flexible tooling from the DSL world. Show you one more real world example. This is actually the border between internal and external DSLs. And this is another behavior driven development tool called Cucumber. This is actually a very popular behavior driven development tool. Um, uh, it is implemented in some flavor of Ruby. So the external DSL part of this is parsed in Ruby, but then you have your choice of what language you want to write your step definitions in, which is one of the reasons that Cucumber is very, very popular. Uh, and it's cool for us because it uses both internal and external DSLs, and it does so exactly correctly and from the way that you should uh, use one versus the other. So here's an example of a Cucumber specification. This is an external DSL written by the guy who created Cucumber. In fact, the syntax of this, this language is called Gherkin. Gherkin's a kind of pickle, and this is Cucumber, so uh, this is called Gherkin. And so when you write Cucumber tests, you write Cucumber tests in this external DSL called Gherkin. When you run these, it actually spits out the step definitions for you, and by default, these guys are in Ruby. And this is an internal DSL. In fact, what happens is it matches the things in Cucumber with regular expressions to those step definitions down in the Ruby code. So you can see that that actually maps down to that string with a regular expression embedded in it for a replaceable value, but that's exactly how this auto-generated code is uh, mapping. And you can see something that takes two parameters, it actually maps that in the step, it passes in those two parameters as room count and booking count, and you have access to those guys there. This is actually the, the perfect split between internal and external DSLs, because Gherkin is an external DSL, and the Ruby code, and actually any language you want for the step definitions, is an internal DSL. Because developers are okay with internal DSLs. The big problem with internal DSLs for end users is that if you don't type everything exactly right, you're going to get a really confusing error message. Because you're going to get some sort of Ruby error message or some sort of groovy error message that as an end user you're never going to understand. Developers are okay with those kind of error messages because we understand that this is a language sitting on top of a language, but it's very cumbersome for users to have to deal with. Building external DSLs allows you to control error messages and other things very, very precisely and allows you to give much better feedback to your user and much more contextual feedback to your user. And so I think Cucumber got it right. Leave the internal DSL for the developers because they're okay with that abstraction, but take the extra effort to build uh, an external DSL for the user's consumption of this code. And that is a nice segue into external DSLs. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this because I want to show you the state of the art and the tooling around this. And in fact, consider this little snippet. What I'm trying to capture here are some options for a loyalty rewards program for like a hotel or a resort or something like that. So you get 300 points for a stay three nights at Brie and 150 per day for a stay two nights at Brie and 60 for stay one night at Orthoc or Helm's Deep or Dunharrow. This kind of code is extraordinarily difficult to build a really good user interface for because you have all these or possibilities in there, and they're going to be structured slightly differently. There's not that many changes, but it's very hard to structure this and build an effective user interface. And I've seen people go to enormous, ridiculous lengths to try to create a flexible user interface for this, when this is actually what the business analyst wants. This is the way they think about this. They'd much rather just write this down and have you figure out how to make it work. And this is exactly the realm of an external DSL. And in fact, this one is a kind of particular kind, algorithmic business rules are very hard to write good UIs for. And most of the time, the user doesn't even want a UI, they just want to be able to express it in the way that they're used to expressing it. 
So there are a couple of different kinds of external DSLs, or at least simple ones, that I'll talk about here. One of them, it looks like this, where you have a single line that represents each record in your DSL. And that is a version of a DSL called Delimiter Directed Translation, where the delimiter, which is the new line, is going to tell me where each chunk of information lives. And I'm also going to use embedded translation, meaning as I encounter elements, I'm going to go ahead and populate the, uh, the semantic model with them. Uh, another alternative is to actually harvest them all together and then traverse that tree and generate the semantic model then. But I don't need to do that in my case. I can just generate them in line. So I'm going to show you real quickly how this works. This is in C-sharp because C-sharp has uh, named regular expression groups. But this is where you parse this guy. And so I'm going to come in here, and uh, for each line, I'm going to read it. There's a continuation character, but then I'm going to parse that line. So what does parse line do? Parse line comes in, and for delimiter-directed translation, for each line and input, it actually parses those things and uh, lets you do something with it. So here's parse line. It removes the comment. Uh, if it's an empty line, it returns. Otherwise, it tries to parse an offer line. So let's see what offer line parser does. What offer line parser does is use regular expressions. It uses a regular expression for reward, activity, and location. And so I'm looking for a regular expression as a reward plus four plus activity plus at plus location. So these all fit. So I've got that's the reward for stay three nights is the activity, at Bree is the location. So it looks like all these fit into that general kind of parsing right there. So I parse these out using regular expressions. And once I've grabbed one of these uh, particular things, once it is harvested and figured out if this is a, a group or an activity. So for example, if I grab an activity, this could be one of two things. It could be a stay or it could be something else. So I need to take account for that to be a stay. And then here's why I'm actually parsing out um, my activity. This is a stay for certain overnights for a certain amount. So you can kind of see how this works. You're basically, for each chunk that you need to interpret, you're building regular expressions and basically saying, well, anytime I get one of these chunks, pull it apart with regular expressions and harvest those values and do something interesting with them. Like return uh, a particular uh, value for one of these guys. Embedded translation says as soon as you encounter these things in the grammar, you go ahead and output them. Uh, this particular delimiter directed translation DSL is, is good for single line records. But we'd also like to have containership. And if you want to go with containership like this, this is Mrs. H's um, DSL, then you have to go to syntax directed translation. And here's where you actually build a grammar to parse this stuff. So syntax-directed translation, you uh, use a grammar and a parser. You create a grammar, and then a tool will parse and lex that code for you, break it up into tokens, and make sure that it adheres to your grammar, and then will hand you this tree-shaped data structure that you can deal with. So for example, here's a chunk of grammar for an event block in my world. Actually, I'm going to go ahead because there's a better one right here. So this says an event block consists of the events keyword followed by one or more event declarations followed by end. An event declaration is an ID followed by an ID. An ID is letters and digits, and that's what letters look like, and that's what digits look like. So this is a snippet of grammar that can successfully parse this little chunk of code that I have up here. This is in Bacchus Nauer uh, grammar format. Notice that there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between the grammar and the thing that you parse with that grammar. For example, this is a perfectly legal way to parse event block, as you see up above. But so is this. Here I've just added a separate data structure, event list, which consists of one or more event declarations. This grammar will parse it too. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a grammar and what it will parse. It really depends on what you want the data structures coming out the other end to look like. For example, when I parse this stuff, it's going to lex it into data structures, name value pairs, then goes through syntactic analysis, and then build this tree-shaped structure for me. So the way that structure looks is very much contingent on the grammar that I use to parse it. For example, 
Here's a little snippet of my code. If I use this grammar at the top to parse it, I'm going to end up with a data structure that looks like this. But if I use the bottom grammar to parse it, I'm going to end up with a data structure that looks like this. And if I need to do something with all the event lists as part of my semantic model, this is going to be a more convenient grammar for me to use because there's already a container here for all these events. I don't have to actually traverse the tree to find all of them. So you may modify the grammar to get the data structures off the back end to look more like something that you want them to look like. And the idea of embedded translation, Antler in includes a feature that allows you as part of your grammar definition to actually put calls to methods inside there. So this is my grammar definition for event and antler, but I can say in there inside curly braces, register event, dollar sign E result there is the data structure E that antler is maintaining. And so here, I'm actually calling methods as in my semantic model to populate them with the events as I'm encountering them in my uh, grammar. Okay, well that's all fine and good, but that looks like kind of a big pain. And in fact, this has largely been a pain for a few decades, which is why people don't do this much. It's gotten a little easier since university days, but uh, there's a whole new category of tool that's coming along that's really turning this kind of, of uh, coding on its head. And it's around this idea of a language workbench. A language workbench is a tool that supports language-oriented programming that, that makes it as easy to create languages as we create other abstractions here. And there are a couple of these. I'll show you examples of two of them. I'll talk about three of them. The first one is intentional software by Char being created by Charles Simone. Does anybody recognize his name? He's actually infamous for one thing and famous for two things. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Excel, yes. Excel, he was the, the creator of Excel. In fact, he created Excel and then Microsoft bought his company and it became Excel. So he was the original creator of, of Excel. That's one of the things he's famous for. Um, the thing that he's infamous for is creating Hungarian notation. He's the guy at Microsoft who created Hungarian notation. He's still trying to live that down. The, the, the other thing that he's famous for is that he likes to vacation in space. So Charles, back in the late 90s, had this vision for building this language workbench thing, and Microsoft wasn't that interested in implementing it. So he did what any multi-billionaire would do. He left Microsoft and founded his own company, Intentional Software. And they've been working on this thing for like a decade. But there's a problem when you're a multi-billionaire. He has really hard decisions to make, like, should I work on Intentional or should I take another vacation in space? I don't know. That's really tough. You know, space is kind of cool. He's been twice. I think he's going a third time. It's only $25 million a trip, and that's pocket change for him. So it's really more about scheduling to get up there than anything else. And so they have been having a hard time actually producing anything, and they also have a really scary NDA. And when they produce something, I think they expect it's going to be this really expensive commercial tool. The open source world has kind of end around them. Oh, this is Charles, by the way, in his uh, space suit or space helmet. And there are two tools in the open source world that are already doing some aspects of what Intentional is planning to do. And I'll show you quick examples of both of these, XTEX by Open Architecture Wear and MPS by JetBrains. The idea of a language workbench is to change this relationship. You've had this relationship with code ever since you uh, wrote your very first Hello World program, where you write code in some sort of uh, text format that is also a storage format. You hand this off to a parser. It parses and compiles it, and then it does the work to create that in an executable representation for you. But then something sneaky happened. The IntelliJ guys did something kind of sneaky. They actually created the first kind of proto-language workbench. Because when IntelliJ came out, it included refactoring support. And a lot of people assume, and still assume, that when you refactor and rename something, it's doing a big giant search and replace through your code. It doesn't do that. That would be too crazily inefficient on large projects. What it does is modify the abstract syntax tree and then project that back out in the source code. 
It was the first tool that lets you directly manipulate the abstract syntax tree and then recast that back into source code. And that's how all the refactoring tools work. Have you ever noticed that a search for a term through a large project is much slower than refactor rename for the same term in a project? That's because you're actually doing it at the, at the core and then projecting that back out rather than doing a search to the entire code base. And that's exactly what these language workbenches do. You manipulate the abstract syntax tree through projections. And one of the projections may be a text editor, or one of the projections may be some sort of form designer, or maybe it's an ER diagramming tool. You should be able to switch back and forth between any one of these representations at any time and still have full fidelity representations. You basically build the abstraction the way you want to see, and then the workbench takes care of projecting it in a certain format. Intentional is very ambitious around this. Uh, MPS and Xtext are a little less ambitious in a variety of ways. So Xtext is a framework and a tool for developing external textual DSLs. This is actually based on Open Architecture Wear, which is a model-driven architecture tool. Before these guys realized with everybody else that the whole cartoons the code thing wouldn't really work particularly well. And so they've actually re-engineered it to be more text-based, which I think is a smart idea. You give them a grammar in their format, and they'll build all kinds of cool stuff for you. This is all Eclipse-based, and so it actually builds an Eclipse plugin for you that is editor-aware. So when you create things in Xtext, you're creating source, but you're also creating source for an Eclipse plugin. It'll actually create the editor plugin for you, and when you compile it, it'll install it inside Eclipse and let you interact with it. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Here is Mrs. H's grammar in uh, Xtext. You can see there's the state machine, etc. This is a subset of a Bacchus Nower. This is a slightly different uh, format that they use. Uh, the, they realize that you want this into a standard format, so it also produces an antler grammar for the grammar that it creates for you. All of these tools in some ways have to map down to a template so that you can do something with your DSL. I'm actually going to go to this next one, which is better. So basically, you go in to create a template and say, for each state as S, and now you can write some Java code. And for each transition as T within that state, you can do some work, like t.state.actions. So this is the mapping between the things that show up in your DSL and the code that you do to them. It basically populates your DSL syntax into this template and then executes it. But here's the really nice thing that Xtext does for you. It gives you a fully functioning Eclipse editor. So this is Mrs. H's DSL language. Notice I get syntax highlighting just like it was source code. I can come in here and I have the same kind of navigability that Eclipse has. I hold down the control key and it'll actually now jump between definitions for me. I can also do things like uh, find all the references in the workspace for something. There's door closed, so I found it. I can also come up here and say, give me uh, all the uh, references in the workspace for something like unlock panel, and notice I can navigate to both of those guys. I can also come in here and add new stuff if I want, and you'll notice when I come in and start adding stuff, I can hit control space bar. It gives me exactly the syntax that's appropriate for this part of my grammar. It's letting me fill in values here in operators. Notice there's a squiggly line down there because the code's not valid anymore, syntactically valid. If I come in and add my end, then everything's okay. And if I come in and even misspell one of the keywords, I get the same red squiggly lines that you get if you have a syntax error in your source code. So Xtext is actually building this full-featured syntax highlighting a code insight editor for you for your language. All you have to do is give it the grammar, and it builds the rest of this stuff for you. You give it the grammar, you give it the template, and now you have a way for people to interact with your code and execute it. That's pretty cool. It's the most mature of the text-based DSL tools. It's still kind of extricating itself from open architecture and MB, uh, MDA. Uh, it is heavily Eclipse-based, but the idea is you actually ship the stripped-down version of Eclipse with it, and now your users have an IDE that has your syntax and source code in it. Uh, and this does a really efficient generation of a lot of really nice uh, things, including that really nice editor projection. And this is my fourth practical use, is the ability to give users really, really focused kinds of uh, tools.
The last one of these I'll talk about is uh, MPS from JetBrains. This started as an internal project from JetBrains based on some lessons they learned with IntelliJ. There are a bunch of really smart language guys at uh, JetBrains. They've also created the language Kotlin, which is uh, partially related to some of their MPS work. Um, and they've been using this for a while to build new products, and they've open sourced this thing. Uh, this is more than three plus years now. It's more like five plus years now, probably. And in fact, version two of MPS just came out. MPS is a little more ambitious in that they're not purely text-based, although you can create text-based DSLs in uh, MPS. You come in MPS and create concepts. A concept can have properties and it can have methods and it can have aspects on it. You can also come in and create a concept editor. And what I'm doing here is basically saying, I want this when I type it in, you won't see any of these grid lines, but when I type in a profile, I want to be able to supply a name, and then membership and frequency will come in tabbed in from that automatically when my uh, uh, language generates my code. Here's the template. This is how you map your DSL to actual code. This is kind of like the template we saw in the XTEX world, where now I can pull features from my DSL and include them in Java code. But this, of course, is the coolest part. This is actually using the editor in MPS. So notice when I create a new line here, it's expecting a statement. When I hit Control Spacebar here, I actually get a huge number of things. You can filter this down to things that are just applicable to your language, like Xtext. But notice there's a ton of stuff already here, some classes, but some other things that might be potentially useful for us. But if I want to create a discount here, uh, discount is uh, expects a name and then a profile that it's based on. So I can come in and create a discount. Notice as I start typing, it'll fill in the rest of the syntax for me. As I tab away, it creates placeholders for those things I'm supposed to fill in. So this one is actually more syntactically flexible in terms of you can lay it out pretty much any way that you want. You can do grids, you can do columns, you can do lists, you can do freeform text, etc. But this is the coolest part of MPS. Because you notice when I pulled down that list, all those things came down. MPS is concept declaration. For every concept you have, you can create an editor for that concept. So here's an example of a DSL that does uh, time-based service calls. But this is an amount. And you'll notice in MPS, when I pull down amount here, I get not only the ability to put numbers in, but I can also put Excel formulas in here. Because the number concept in MPS knows that, oh, to generate a number, it might be a number or it might be an Excel formula. This allows you to drop Excel formulas into your DSL just by saying, include Excel formulas. And now your business analyst can use Excel formulas as part of their DSL. And as much as business analysts love Excel formulas, they're going to think this is the greatest thing ever. And this is, in fact, my second 4B example. Would you like Excel formulas? It'll take me all of 10 minutes to add them, if you'd like them, as a way to do calculations and other things within your DSL. That's very cool. So to summarize, DSLs are more expressive than tools or frameworks. In fact, they're at a level of granularity below most tools and frameworks. You can use these to build fluent interfaces to make your code more readable so that non-developers can read it or just for yourself to make this a lot more readable. You see a lot of these internal DSLs in the JavaScript world to make things more readable, to, to uh, rub away some of the kind of obnoxious syntax that JavaScript has sometimes. You can create more finely honed tools here using both internal DSLs and external DSLs. And ultimately, this gives you better communication between technical and non-technical people because if they have a better chance of reading your code, you have a better chance of having a good conversation with them rather than speaking at one another. And especially some of the new tools give you building blocks for entirely new capabilities that are really exciting. Uh, actually, the goal of Intentional by Charles Simoni, I don't know if you've ever tried to take Excel away from an accountant. But if you do, you have a fist fight on your hands. What Charles wants to do is create all tools for, develop, for end users that they love as much as accountants love Excel by creating these really, really carefully honed tools that work the way that their brains work. That's all I have. I have like a minute for questions. Does anybody have a question they want to ask? Yes. Express the right language of what the business is uh, demanding.
So her question is, if you take some concepts from domain-driven design, and should DSLs be used as a way to express these core business concepts? Very often, yes. Particularly if you have a domain that has a lot of jargon in it, or has a lot of well-defined terms, and particularly if you have the situation where they want to be able to put together algorithms and other things that would be very hard for you to put together, I think that's actually a perfect use for DSLs. Because you actually build your business's language along with your technical language, and can kind of build both of them at the same time. So I, I think you'll see that use a lot, actually, in DSLs. Hi. Yes. Um, if I could think so. Oh, like business rules engines. Yep. Very good question. Expecting to get those nasty developers out of the equation and just let the end users, the subject matter experts, fill in those business rules. Here's the problem. Those business people are not programmers. So you know what's going to happen? They're going to have this really complex business rule, and there's going to be one little difference that they need to do. But they don't know about refactoring and stuff like that, so how are they going to reuse that? They're going to copy and paste the whole thing over here, make one little change. So over time, you end up with this huge, sprawling mess that nobody can actually navigate and figure out what's going on. Um, that's a problem with uh, rules engines in general. This is a little less constraining because you can build it exactly the way you want. And because this is a developer tool, you can refactor and do other sorts of things to it. And you're still getting it very close to what the, the end user wants, which is the, whatever language that they normally talk in, rather than trying to cram your business into whatever hierarchies your business rule engine happens to have. So it takes longer to build these. They did using a business rules engine, but these scale much, much longer than business rules engines because you're actually building very custom capabilities. Yeah, hi. As, as you told that, on one hand, we are having domain experts, on one hand, we are having our nasty developers. Mm -hmm. So, like all the business rules, they are derived from the domain expertise. Mm -hmm. So, like, can we use all those things to just to, as we are having in the behavior driven development framework, just to write them into ubiquitous language and finally translate them into the our logic, our system specific. In the thing. perfect world, yes. But this actually misses one important point. Your business analyst doesn't want to be a developer. They don't really want to write this and figure out how to get the syntax to work and all that stuff. So if you can get them to do it, it's fantastic. And in fact, we've had a little bit of success getting business analysts to write Cucumber Test, which is a DSL. But in general, just that they can read it is good enough. That's actually the first goal. Get something they can read. And if you can get them to write it for you, bonus. But it's almost impossible to get them to do that. But you can get them to read it and understand it. And that's a, a pretty nice win. We can provide a user interface also to write all those ubiquitous language things. Yep, absolutely. You can you can get them to write it. In my experience, it's much easier to get them to read it than to write it. And there's still a lot of benefit to having them read it. Uh, if, if you only get that far, that's still a pretty nice thing. Thanks. Yep. Okay, looks like I'm out of time. So uh, thanks very much for coming, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it.